All right, comrades. So this is a welcome to the second half of this educational on uh, the nature of the capitalist state based on uh, the readings of, uh, from uh, Lenin's State and Revolution. Uh, the first part, of course, we dealt with chapters one through three, and today I'll be looking uh, and we'll be discussing uh, the, the final three chapters, uh, four, five, and six. Um, let me just say at the outset, first of all, because we, this session is going to be shorter than the first session. Um, we only have about an hour set aside for this in total for discussion and everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but let me also suggest that um, the main uh, lines of the, the thesis or theses, in fact, that Lenin put forward in this, his famous pamphlet, State and Revolution, were actually laid out in the first three chapters. Um, it's not to say that the that four, five, and six um, is without content. It, it, these chapters are rich with content as well, but in many respects, they are amplifying or uh, elaborating on certain aspects of the questions which were already identified in the first three chapters. Um, so for instance, uh, um, let me just get my notes out here about it. Uh, chapter four, for instance, uh, there's some interesting stuff on the housing question and on the question of rents uh, in a socialist society. Very interesting um, uh, points that are made there. Um, there's a, a reference uh, in chapter four <clears throat> to the uh, conceivable possibility of a relatively peaceful transform uh, transformation to socialism, a peaceful revolution. Um, Obviously, it wasn't the case in Germany at the time. Certainly, wasn't the case in Tsarist Russia, uh, or even during the period of the uh, um, the period between the two revolutions, the February and the October Socialist Revolution of, of 1917, and in most other countries. But uh, Lenin did uh, um, refer, in fact, <clears throat> to the fact that it's uh, conceivable under certain circumstances for a relatively peaceful. Uh, trans transition or transformation to socialism, which I, I thought was rather interesting. Chapter four also gets into more discussion about the concept <clears throat> of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And there's also a very interesting section in, in, in chapter four that deals with the issue of a new socialist state and whether it would be federalist in character or centralist uh, state and how that relates to the national question. It's a very interesting uh, section of this chapter because what Lenin is addressing of course and uh, even though he doesn't use examples from Russia because State and Revolution was written virtually two months before the October Revolution uh, and things were moving very quickly towards the question of the the, the victory of working class power in Soviet Russia uh, and then what to do once that power was achieved to establish a new state, a proletarian state, and what would be the character of that state, it became a very concrete issue for them because obviously in Tsarist Russia, which was called the prison house of nations, there were uh, and, and um, continued to be under the Soviet Union, uh, um, many uh, nations, many national groupings, and so in the Soviet structure, for instance, there were 15 full republics. There were a number of autonomous republics. Within these republics, there were autonomous regions uh, and so on. You had a whole lattice, if you will, of, of uh, structures to um, recognize the national, the multinational character of, um, of, the, of the Soviet Union which by the way, bears particular relevance in a country like Canada because we're also a multinational state. And he makes the point that um, it is, was important for the Soviet government to be a centralist state, not a, um, an authoritarian state or, or one that um, uh, denies the national uh, rights of, of the respective nations within the Soviet Union, but precisely a centralist state that could guarantee the protection of those of those rights and also the uh, equitable sharing and distribution of uh, sparse resources 
within the new republic, that only uh, a, a centralized government could achieve that. Um, and in fact, in the Soviet Union, there was a, a, a very centralized state, even though they had also Republican governments and they had autonomous regions and so on and so forth. But decisive questions, dealing with the economy, dealing with infrastructure and, and so on, dealing with um, 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 the, you know, the development of industry, the electrif electrification of the country, uh, dealing with foreign trade, uh, and obviously dealing with the, uh, um, the, the military, the defense of the Republic from without, uh, and also uh, dealing with the, the prospects of counter-revolution from within, it was necessary to have a, um, uh, a very centralized structure. So you had, um, you had ministries, for instance, in, in agriculture, ministries in mining, and ministries in different sectors of the economy, uh, central planning for the whole country and to serve the whole uh, of, of the working class and of, of working people more generally in the country. Um, and, and it's interesting that in, in, in this chapter four of uh, State and Revolution, Lenin is already developing his thoughts about how the Soviet Union uh, in particular would need to develop. Um, Chapter five gets into some, some interesting questions, uh, like for instance, uh, the whole issue of the withering away of the proletarian state as socialism goes from its early stages of communism, which is socialism, a whole transitional period leading to the full communist society. But during that period, the proletarian state would wither away gradually. Um, but he makes the point, rather interesting point, that it's likely to be a, a lengthy process. The more he looked at it, he realized that this is something that isn't going to be able to be done overnight, obviously. That was the position, of course, that the anarchists uh, uh, advocated, just abolishing the state and, and, and doing away with it overnight. But that, that, that transitional period from the early stages of, uh, of uh, communist society, namely socialism, to a much more mature and fully developed uh, com communist society uh, would be a complicated process. And so the withering away of the state uh, would probably be a lengthy, um, um, uh, you know, a, a lengthy process. Uh, and, and here also in chapter five, he gets in not only to the question of the state as the state in the, in the sense of administering, administrating um, education and, uh, and the police and the courts and all this sort of stuff, but also the economic aspect of socialism moving to communism. In other words, the development of um, higher levels of productivity to uh, be able to um, uh, uh, achieve a situation where want and despair, unemployment, poverty, uh, and miseration are eliminated and where people will have a different attitude towards their own labor so that they will be uh, they would still be working, but they would be working not to avoid uh, starvation or just to put a roof over the head, but they would be working because they're making a conscious contribution uh, to society in a field that they wanted to work in. So they weren't forced to, to take whatever job was available, uh, as is the case in a capitalist labor market. Um, people scurrying around, even getting degrees, and then, and then end up delivering pizza and so on and so forth. But that, uh, in, in fact, uh, there would be the socioeconomic basis, the productive basis in a society, so that people's attitudes towards even their own labor would be understood differently than it is in a capitalist um, uh, labor market, which is driven by the law of value. In other words, you know, your wages, you, you get paid for your, your time on the job, which isn't commensurate with the value that you produce and so on and so forth. But it's, it's rather kind of uh, interesting the way he approaches that in chapter five. Um, and uh, then he, of course, gets into a, a long discussion in chapter five around bourgeois democracy, uh, 
uh, and and what uh, in a way what socialist democracy would start to look at. And of course, throughout chapters four, five, and six as well, there is the polemic not only with the opportunists but also with the anarchists and and uh, uh, their respective attitudes towards the state. So there's lots of pearls in in the in the final three uh, chapters, and I just picked out a few of them which I thought were of particular interest. First of all, it talks about planning under monopoly capitalism. This is a very interesting quote. I'm not going to read it all out, but basically what he's getting at is this, that there is this attitude, and by the way, it exists today as well, that under monopoly capitalism, as opposed to the earlier types of capitalism, um, these big trusts, these big monopolies, these big transnationals do extensive planning. We know that they do that. They have just-in-time uh, uh, production uh, systems uh, that are all automated and uh, operate on the basis of algorithms and so on and so forth. Um, they plan not only on a national basis, but on an international basis in terms of what product lines that they develop and so on and so forth. And he, and he, what he does here is he, he says, it's, it's true, that is true, but it is not state socialism that the trusts, of course, never provided, do not now provide, and cannot provide complete planning. So they do planning, but it's still in the basis of the, of the anarchy of the capitalist market. But however much they do plan, however, however much the capitalist magnates calculate in advance the volume of production on a national or even international scale, and however much uh, they systematically regulate it, we're st we are still... Uh, we still remain under capitalism. At its new stage, it's true, but still capitalism without a doubt. It's a rather interesting uh, uh, observation and a very astute observation because, uh, you know, even today you run into people who have this view that, uh, well, um, you know, what's the difference between state capitalism and state socialism? Well, <laughs> really it's a question of which class is in command of society, right? Um, he has some interesting observations about bourgeois democracy and the dictatorship of the proletariat. We'll get around to the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat in a moment. But here he writes that uh, Engels realized here that in a particularly striking form, the fundamental idea which runs through all of Marx's work, namely that the democratic republic is the nearest approach to the dictatorship of the proletariat. For such a republic, without in the least abolishing the rule of capital, and therefore the oppression of the masses and the class struggle in inevitably leads to such an extension, development, unfolding and intensification of the struggle that as soon as it becomes possible to meet the fundamental interests of the oppressed masses, this possibility is realized inevitably and solely through the dictatorship of the, of the proletariat. In other words, what he's saying is, is that the, de the development of uh, bourgeois democratic norms under capitalism in a certain way helps to create, create the preconditions for the transition, a revolutionary transition to the dictatorship of, of the proletariat. It's rather an interesting uh, um, uh, thought. Um, he goes on to talk about bourgeois democracy and the proletarian revolution. And, and uh, it says two more remarks, but I'm just quoting the, the first remarks from Engels. Engels statement that in a democratic republic, no less than in a monarchy, the state remains the machine of the oppression of one class by another. And of course, Engels did say that, that regardless of whether it's a, um, it's a feudal state or it's, a, it's an authoritarian state, a fascist state, a democratic, bourgeois democratic state, they, they all remain machines of the oppression of one class by another then he goes on to point out that Engels by no means suggested or that this signifies that the form of the oppression makes no difference to the working class, to the proletariat. As some anarchists teach, a wider, freer, and more open form of the class struggle and of class oppression vastly assists the working class in its struggle for the abolition, abolition of classes in general. In other words, what he's saying here is that as Marxists, we're not indifferent to the character of the state. But even though we have a, a, um, a clear theoretical and political understanding of the bourgeois state, a bourgeois democratic state is a hell of a lot better than a fascist state. 
and creates better conditions uh, for for the advancement of the class struggle and ultimately for the for the victory of uh, of socialism. It's a, it's important here because you know as 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 uh, Lenin says in this uh, in this quote, uh, anarchists say you know the state is the state is the state. Well, not so. We need to be very concrete and look at the character of the state, and we need on that basis to fight for reforms even of the capitalist state. Just like, for instance, our party fights for proportional representation. We know that proportional representation isn't all of a sudden going to solve or remove um, the inherently distorted character of bourgeois democracy. Uh, it will bring a little bit closer uh, reflection of the, of the diversity of views within society than the first past the post system but it's not a panacea, it's not a solution. It doesn't mean, however, that because uh, whether it has proportional representation or, or not proportional representation, that it's still a capitalist state, what difference does it make? And here Lenin's saying, no, it does make a difference. And we're not indifferent and should not be indifferent to the type of, uh, of, of, of capitalist state that exists, even while we fight ultimately for the seizure of power and ultimately for the crushing, for the dismantling of the, of the bourgeois state and the construction of a new proletarian state in its place. And here he talks about, uh, uh, he's quoting again from, from uh, Marx about this transitional period between capitalism and communism. And he quotes Marx say, between capitalist and communist society lies a period of revolutionary transformation of one into the other. Corresponding to this is also a political transition period in which the state can be nothing, nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletarian. Why is it important to, re to remember this? Well, in Lenin's time and ever since the denigrators of Marxism have tried to counterpose Lenin to Marx, say that Lenin was dictatorial, he supported the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat, and that Marx never said anything about it. Not true. Marx uh, uh, understood particularly, not at the time of writing the Communist Manifesto in 1848, but particularly subsequent to that in 52, uh, when there was a it was an upsurge in the revolutionary movement in in France, and especially after the communes, the Paris Commune in, in 1871, had a very clear understanding of of, of this and and was a, an advocate of uh, not just saying that that was an option, a revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat, but saying that it could be nothing but that whole transition period could be nothing but a revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. Here's another interesting quote that I have called from these chapters uh, on the limitations of bourgeois democracy. I, I, this, is, this is wonderful. I like this. So I'm going to read it in full. In a capitalist society, providing it develops under the most favorable conditions, we have a more or less complete democracy in the democratic republic. But this democracy is always hemmed in by the narrow limits set by capitalist exploitation and consequently always remains in effect a democracy for the minority, only for the property classes, only for the rich. Freedom in capitalist society always remains about the same as it was in the ancient Greek republics, freedom for the slave owners. Owing to the conditions of capitalist exploitation, the modern wage slaves are so crushed by want and poverty that they can't be bothered with democracy, cannot be bothered with politics in the ordinary peaceful course of events the majority of the population is debarred from participation in public and political life. And he goes on here, just to continue, democracy for the insignificant minority, democracy for the rich, that is the democracy of capitalist society. If we look more closely into the machinery of capitalist democracy, we see everywhere in the petty or supposedly petty details of, the, of suffrage, residential qualifications, exclusions of women, um, we know, obviously, of course, how uh, even after blacks supposedly were liberated in the United States after the Civil War in 1861, how they were uh, systematically kept off the, the voting rolls in most of the southern states and what have you. 
using technicalities and whatnot. In the technique of representative institutions and the actual obstacles to the right of assembly, uh, in the purely capitalist organization of the daily press, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we see restriction after restriction after restriction upon democracy. These restrictions, exceptions, exclusions, obstacles for the poor seem slight, especially in the eyes of, of one who has never known want himself and has never been close in close contact with the oppressed classes uh, in their mass life. And he says parenthetically, Nine out of the 10, if not 99 out of 100 bourgeois publicists and politicians come under this category. And in other words, these fine gentlemen are so disconnected from the plight of ordinary working people that this whole exclusion doesn't seem, to, doesn't seem obvious to them. They don't notice it. I mean, they participate in elections. They, they fund political parties. They get involved. They go to the conventions of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party and so on. Um, um, so it doesn't seem obvious to them. But in their sum total, these restrictions exclude and squeeze out the poor from politics, from a active participation in democracy. And what an interesting uh, s set of paragraphs here, because here Lenin is talking about something we talk about all the time today in 2020, about how people are so uh, apathetic, well, they're not apathetic, but they are so cynical about politics and you go and talk to people and say, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with politics precisely because they are systematically excluded from, from a real participation, real administration of, of the state um, that regardless of which party they vote for, um, their promises are never kept and they're always uh, betrayed and so on and so forth. And, and here Lenin is talking about this, you know, more than a hundred years ago, and it still rings true today, uh, even in modern conditions. I, I found that really quite fascinating. This is another interesting quote where he talks about what would happen in a socialist society where you still need a state to repress the, uh, the, uh, the privileged minority, the capitalist class who've lost their power, but are still very powerful and we'll try to organize counter-revolution, subversion, and so on and so forth. And he says, well, yes, so there will still be a need for a state in a certain sense, uh, but now a transitional state that is no longer a state in the proper sense of the word, that's to say under capitalism or other class-divided societies, for the suppression of the minority by the majority of the wage slaves of yesterday is comparatively so easy simple and a natural task that will entail far less bloodshed than the suppression of the risings of slaves, of serfs, of wage laborers, and it will cost mankind uh, far less. It is compatible with the extension of democracy to such an overwhelming majority of the population that the need for a special machine of suppression will begin to disappear. I found this really kind of interesting because of the way it suggests that, well, Keeping, keeping down the counter-revolutionaries and the old privileged elite um, is comparatively easy. And, uh, you know, <laughs> well, in life, of course, it proves to be much more complicated. And one of the reasons, of course, it's much more complicated is that we're not just talking about the, um, the former ruling class in a given country that has a, you know, uh, some sort of transformative... Uh, a process underway, uh, either a full socialist revolution or maybe something oriented towards socialism, like in Venezuela. But it's not just a question of the of the ruling class in that country, but also the international ruling class. In other words, the the international forces of imperialism that will constantly pressurize uh, um, uh, revolutionary states. At the time. I think even Lenin probably underestimated um, th this factor that it's, you know, and by saying it's comparatively so easy to, to, to deal, to deal with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the exploiting minority once they lose power. Well, a little bit more complicated than that as life turned out. <laughs>
Here's another an interesting quote, uh, which I've called against utopianism and nihilism. And here he's, 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 he's quoting Marx <clears throat> in response to uh, LaSalle. Uh, um, and he's talking, uh, and LaSalle was one of the anarchist types in the first international. <clears throat> and he says, uh, what we have to deal with here in analyzing the program of Workers' Party is a communist society, not as it developed on its own foundations, but on the contrary, just as it emerges from capitalist society, which is thus in every respect, economically, morally, and intellectually still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it comes. Very concise, but, but important statement, you know, um, if you are a utopian and you just dream of a, of a different type of society uh, and forget that whatever comes after the revolution will be built on all of the ashes of all of the, um, um, the, the remains of a capitalist society. And I'm not meaning just economically, structurally in terms of uh, um, the state apparatus and so on and so forth, but just the weight of tradition, the weight of, of uh, the ideological weight of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of, uh, of, of domination. So that, that socialism is going to still be stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it comes. It's a very important concept that we should never lose sight of. And that, of course, is what makes it so uh, uh, complicated, not a simple process of going from capitalism to socialism and, and, to, and to communism. Um, because, uh, um, because, you know, you're going from thesis to antithesis to synthesis. Um, in a philosophical sense, we can talk about better in those terms. But the reality is that is a very complicated thing because a lot of the contradictions of the old society, which, by the way, include things like um, um, uh, idealism, the impact of organized religion, uh, racism, sexism, and patriarchy, all of these things that were part of the birthmarks of the old society will need to be contended with in developing uh, uh, the new uh, socialist society. Uh, so it's, it's, it seems simple, but it's really quite an important concept. Here he talks about the economic uh, basis of the withering away of the state under socialism. Uh, and uh, he says that uh, part of it has to do with the fact that it's possible for the productive forces to develop at a tremendous extent. And we see how incredibly uh, capitalism is already retarding this process when we see how much progress could be achieved on the basis of the level of technique already attained, we're entitled to say that the full, with the fullest confidence that the expropriation of the capitalists will inevitably result in an enormous development of the productive forces of human society. But how rapidly this development proceed, how soon it will reach the point of breaking away from the division of labor, of doing away with the antithesis between mental and physical labor, between the town and the country, of transforming labor into life's prime want, we do not, we do not, and cannot know. So when we speak about the inevitable uh, withering away of the state, emphasizing the protracted nature of this process and its dependent on the rapidity of the development of a higher phase of communism, um, he's basically saying that this economic aspect of uh, raising the productivity of society, of uh, eliminating. Uh, uh, the need for people to uh, um, uh, have their, uh, um, you know, the, the concept of uh, under socialism from each according to their ability to each according to their work uh, to a, a situation under communism where it's from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Um, simple example of that, of course, is that under socialism, you could have two workers, one who's single the other one who's got five kids at home. Um, but if they both put in eight hours of work uh, and they're doing a commensurate type of labor, they both get paid the same under socialism. Um, under communism, it would be different because the wages, uh, the, the, 
or, or the value, let's put it that way, the value of uh, that labor power would be, and, and the, uh, the compensation for that labor power would be based on the needs. And obviously uh, the worker who has five kids at home has more needs than the person who's uh, single. Um, but you can't do that under socialism. That has to wait until communism. And the, and the transition from the earlier socialist stage to the developed communist stage is dependent on increasing productivity. Here's the rub, however. We have now years and years of experience of looking at at least one socialist experiment, not like the Paris Commune, which lasted three months, but of uh, um, the Soviet Union, which lasted 70 years before it was uh, overthrown and uh, collapsed. And the fact is, of course, that uh, the unleashing of the productive forces of human society just went so far. There were tremendous gains in productivity in the early years of the Soviet Union, um, uh, particularly through the 30s and leading up to the Second World War. Then there was a Second World War. Then there was a Cold War. But there were also problems of, uh, uh, of developing productivity even within uh, quite apart from the external pressures on Soviet society within the uh, economic model itself as it developed in the Soviet Union. So this is, a, this is an important question. And, and uh, Marxist political economists uh, still need to wrestle with this question. How to ensure, in fact, that the full potential of socialism in terms of the development of productivity uh, can be realized. And by the way, the other side of it is, should it be realized, given also the pressures on the uh, natural environment and on certain limits, although I don't think we should overstress this matter. Uh, 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 obviously, there's finite resources in the world and so on and so forth. So these are, these are rather complicated questions. But, uh, but I thought it was nevertheless, it was kind of an interesting quote from, from, uh, from Lenin. Here's, here's one last one I'm going to share with you about uh, the type of parliament that exists under working class rule. You know, he says, no, we're not going to get rid of parliaments, but the character of parliaments will change. Instead of being talking shops uh, and, and this kind of isolation between the legislative uh, role of parliamentarism, bourgeois parliamentarism, and the bureaucracy, the administrative side, uh, which is completely out of the control of the, uh, of the legislative side, uh, of the uh, management of the apparatus. He says that, that that would be overcome and that parliaments would take on the character of uh, working um, parliaments. Uh, parliaments of, uh, obviously it would be composed of the working class in the main, but also the character itself of the parliament would change. Uh, and the way to ensure that uh, would be the very steps we talked about last time about the the, the, the ability to uh, that uh, that that bureaucrats, for instance, uh, uh, would be uh, uh, only by election. That be subject to recall. That they would be paid the same as an ordinary working person, uh, and uh, and the introduction of the concept of control by all, uh, so that the bureaucrats, <laughs> the power of the bureaucrats, would essentially be removed. And he goes on to talk about the total abolition of bureaucracy, which of course is another interesting question uh, in, in light of the experience of socialist societies since 1917. Um, uh, it is uh, not so easy uh, to, uh, to cut democracy down to the roots and essentially to completely abolish bureaucracy to the introduction of complete democracy of the people. That doesn't mean that th this objective isn't uh, still a sound one, but it, it, life has shown that it is, it's a struggle. It's a complicated struggle. Uh, and that if you don't acknowledge the difficulty of that struggle, you're likely to repeat the same errors uh, as, as uh, what took place in the former Soviet Union. And finally, he lays out in chapter six, again, what are the fundamental differences between the Marxists and the anarchists? And he says, well, uh, 
the former, the Marxists, while aiming for the complete abolition of the state, recognize that this aim can only be achieved after classes have been abolished by the so socialist revolution as a result of the establishment of socialism, which leads then to the withering away of the state. The latter want to abolish the state completely overnight, not understanding the conditions under which the state can be abolished. It's a very obvious uh, difference between the Marxists and the uh, anarchists approach to the state. Secondly, the former recognizes that the, that the working class, that after the working class has won political power, it must completely destroy the old state machine and replace it with a new one, consisting of the organization of armed workers in the, in the type of the, uh, the form of the commune. The latter, while insisting on the destruction of the state machine, have a very vague idea of what the proletariat will put in its place and how it will use its revolutionary power. And the third big difference, of course, is the former demand that the proletariat be trained for revolution by utilizing the present state and the anarchists reject this. And here he's saying that, you know, part of the training of the working class is, is also engaging in the current bourgeois state. It's not a, necessarily a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to have communists elected to parliament and to use parliament as a rostrum to fight for the, for the interests of the, of the working class. We shouldn't reject that. Uh, in, in a way that is part of the training of revolutionaries. Whereas the anarchists reject all of this and say, no, the hell with elections, the hell with a political struggle and, and so on. So here, Lenin uh, encapsulates some of the fundamental differences between uh, Marxists, communists, and, and anarchists. So finally, a br very brief summary uh, about state and revolution as a whole why he wrote the book. We talked about that last time. He wrote it uh, not only because um, Russia was looking, staring down the possibility of actually achieving working class power and the question of what to do after the revolution succeeds is a very immediate question. Uh, and the attitude towards the state and to the bourgeois state uh, is, a, is a pretty pressing issue. It's not some abstract theoretical issue. But he also wrote it because of this sharp divide within the working class or the broadly speaking Marxist movement of the day uh, reflected in the crisis and collapse of the Second International. And so he's polemicizing against uh, the opportunists, the reformists, like Karl Kautsky and others as well, of course, as against the anarchists. Whoops. So in the main points, the state is an instrument of domination, of class domination. The state is, uh, does not stand above society uh, and, uh, and is not there to reconcile class conflicts. This is rather important. Uh, these are rather important points, fundamentals of state and revolution and of the Marxist view of the state that first of all, the state is an instrument of domination by one class, a minority class, over the oppressed classes, whether they're um, the aristocracy over the serfs or the, the slave owners over the slaves or the bourgeoisie over the working class. But that once the state is formed, it doesn't even if it gives the impression, the appearance of standing somehow above society, it in fact does not stand apart from, is not independent of class relations uh, and that it is not there to reconcile class conflicts but to suppress class struggle. The state in fact actually does in some respects reconcile conflicts and this is kind of an interesting the state has two main roles its main role its primary role of course is to ensure uh, and protect property, property relations, and, and, the, and the, the power of capital based on their ownership of the means of production. That is a very clear point. That's the main function of the state. But the state also uh, serves to mediate conflicts which arise within its own capitalist class. You know, the whole body of law called uh, uh, corporate and property law is precisely about that. It's precisely to uh, have a, 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 a system to mediate between um, 
disputes that arise amongst the, the, the thieves, amongst the robber barons themselves, and to keep that in, in, uh, in, in under some sort of control, some sort of regulation, so that the capitalist class does not tear itself apart. So in other words, the state serves the arch, overarching interests of the capitalist class as a whole, uh, even sometimes by disciplining even some of its own members to stay in line. Um, you know, and so intellectual property law, all of these things are, are, are part of, uh, of uh, not only safeguarding the capitalist class as a whole, but mediating disputes within their own class. That after achieving state power, the working class cannot simply therefore inherit the, cap inherit the capitalist state and use it for its own purposes. This is a pretty basic question, folks, right? And it's one of the main theses that, that Lenin is arguing based on Marx and Engels' own writings, that uh, because of the nature of uh, the bourgeois state, when the working class gains power, it can't simply uh, transform the capitalist state, reform it, uh, prettify it, and so on, and use it for the, the interests of uh, of uh, working people of the oppressed. It has instead uh, to crush, to dismantle the bourgeois state and to create a proletarian state in its place. And that the new proletarian state can be nothing other than the dictatorship of the proletariat. In other words, the dictatorship of the majority over the minority. All states hitherto have been states of uh, the dictatorship of the minority over the majority, the slave owners over the masses of the slaves, the aristocracy over the masses of the serfs, and obviously the bourgeoisie over the masses of the working class. And that this new proletarian state, that's what will wither away as socialism transitions to a more fully mature communist society. And how long that will take? Well, it's still an open question. Finally, that this Marxist approach to the state fundamentally differs from both the reformist and opportunist current, uh, represented by Kautsky and company and the, uh, the Second International, and the anarchist views on the elimination of the state overnight. So this pamphlet is polemical precisely because Lenin is taking on both the reformists, the opportunists on one hand, and the anarchists on the other, and, and clarifying how communists, how Marxists see the question of, um, of uh, the state, uh, the capitalist state, the, the proletarian state, and, its, and its, uh, um, its role, its transitional role in the transition from socialism to communism. So how finally does this all apply today? Well, there's probably lots of applications, but I just pulled out a few. First of all, our conception of, of the capitalist state today and its role in the uh, global system of imperialism. You know, there are lots of people, um, you, you don't hear it as much these days, but it was prevalent back around 2000, around the time of the Battle of Seattle and the big campaigns against uh, globalization and what have you. This view that uh, under globalization of the transnationalization of global capitalism, that the individual state was basically nothing more than a file clerk for international transnational capital. And that it was the IMF that was calling all the shots and, and, uh, and the World Bank and so on and so forth. And that the role of the individual capitalist state was obviously um, of secondary importance, if not unimportant entirely. And this, of course, was um, 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 promoted and or seized upon, particularly by our friends uh, of the Trotskyist persuasion, who argued that, uh, well, this means uh, that uh, we were right all along, that world revolution is the answer, that there needs to be a uh, a worldwide uh, conflagration against uh, capitalism uh, and the worldwide victory. And anything short of that is bound to collapse and so on and so forth. Uh, and that therefore uh, what's important is uh, not 
the struggle for state power in each country, but rather uh, the promotion of uh, a worldwide uh, revolutionary movement. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, as, as, as communists, as Leninists, we dispute that. And life has shown, in fact, that the capitalist state is more important now <laughs> to the global system of imperialism than perhaps it ever was. Um, and uh, we can see how not only in the, in the economic crisis of 2007, 2008, but in the current crisis stemming out of the pandemic, that uh, the capitalist state plays a, a central role in saving the bacon of, of, uh, of, of the ruling capitalist class. Um, and in fact, um, that role will intensify, including its repressive role on behalf of capital. Um, and so um, one of the things that we can draw from state and revolution is really this understanding, which I, I guess we all already understood, but this is a theoretical um, basis for that view of, of the centrality of the capitalist state, the importance of struggling for state power, and then what we do when, when we achieve state power. It also, of course, helps us to understand why we need to struggle against tripartism and class collaboration in the present, uh, present day state. Um, Back in the 70s, uh, in the mid 70s particularly, there was a big push on within the mainstream of the labor movement to promote tripartism. Why? Because, because the, um, the, the leading um, reformist elements, uh, business unionist elements within the trade union movement were deathly afraid that the social contract was melting before their very eyes that Keynesianism was disappearing, that neoliberal policies were coming in, that there was an attack on the trade unions and, and on, on organized labor and all labor, in fact, uh, that public services were coming under sharper attack and, and what have you. And they wanted to save the social contract. And the way that they thought about saving it was by promoting uh, tripartism. And by the way, the government and, and big business said, oh, sure, okay, uh, we're all good. we're good with that. We'll go along with that. And they promoted all sorts of schemes to, to, to have a kind of a, you know, the, the, the three legs of the stool, you know, workers, business, and the state, as if they were all uh, independent of one another uh, and that the state would be a, um, uh, like the referee in a... <laughs> in a cage fight, you know, that, uh, that uh, well, we have one person from labor, one person from business, and then some neutral third party called the state. Well, we understood right from the get-go, precisely because of our Marxist understanding of the state, that that would be disastrous for the working class because it would always be two against one. And that notions of class collaboration with the present day state is an illusion and it basically is the road to, to class surrender. And that's why communists and the labor movement have consistently fought against these kinds of approaches because they are based on a, on a completely erroneous assumption that the state is neutral and independent of the fray between the working class and big business. And finally, in terms of our understanding of the dialectical connection between reform and revolution, this may not seem as obvious, but I, I, I think it, that state and revolution is, is, is useful in terms of this. Because in fact, uh, in many parts of this pamphlet, uh, Lenin talks about, even though the focus is primarily on the capitalist state, on the proletarian revolution, and what the what the working class will do after gaining state power with, with the capitalist state. In many times he, he, he alludes to uh, the, the, the struggle for reforms as part of the revolutionary struggle. He, does, he, he certainly counterposes the Marxists from the reformists, those who advance reformism as the way to fundamental change. 
that somehow we can make incremental changes, almost unnoticeable changes, this petty reform here, that petty reform there, and that somehow after all that and all that and how many centuries and millennia that will take, that somehow one day we will wake up and look around us and say, geez, we live in a socialist society. Um, well, <laughs> that's reformism. But that is different from the question of uh, reforms and the question of uh, quantity and quality, that the struggle for reforms are important uh, and that they, uh, um, at, at a certain point, can um, dialectically uh, transform from qual quantity into quality. Um, but that requires a revolutionary leap. That requires a revolution, not a gradualist change, but a revolutionary leap. Um, and I think that state and revolution in many respects helps that as well. Okay, I've gone on too long again. I'll stop there. <laughs>